to 
worthy this morning. And I am so thankful to him for his grace and his mercy. Amen. Praise the Lord. I've never had the actual privilege, I think, of introducing my mother to speak at a ladies' retreat. I think this may be the very first time. She helped me in piano at Kentucky. I got in a real bind and said, Mom, can you come next weekend to Kentucky? And she came and played the piano. And then in South Carolina, one of my tap leaders, husband got sick at the last minute. And I said, Mom, <laughs> she happened to be there as a retreater. I said, can you, can you lead a tap group, Mom? <laughs> You know, you can ask mummies to do things you can't ask anyone else to do. <laughs> um, but as I prepared for this retreat, I've, I've been looking so forward to it for months. I missed you in April. I wanted to come so bad I couldn't stand it. And so we've been preparing since uh, early spring for this retreat and just kept coming back to mom. She, she wanted to come to this retreat anyway. She wanted to come and see you and be with you. And I said, Mom, if you're going to come, why don't, why don't you just prepare to speak to us and allow the Lord to minister through you. I've heard Mom preach many, many times, but I've prayed for a special anointing for her this morning, that the Lord would just cover her and use her in a way that he needs to use her to touch you. And uh, she's going to be speaking on knowing him. And uh, I believe that it will be a blessing to you. I'm going to ask her to come at this time. I'll give her her full introduction so you don't have to call her mummy all weekend. Gail Harris, and she comes to us from Norfolk, Virginia. Good morning. Good morning. I came to my room yesterday, and... I saw this lovely fruit basket filled with strawberries and plums and peaches and apples and grapes. And I said, I don't know anybody in London. The Lord must have sent it. <laughs> Thank you. Whose ever hands brought it in his name. I shared it with my neighbors and there's still some left. You're welcome to stop by my room and share some. <laughs> I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior and our Lord. He created us in His image, and He redeemed us back to the Father by His precious blood through grace unto everlasting life, that I may know him. We may bear the physical resemblance of another person, but until we really get to know them, we do not know whether we feel or think or act alike. And in order to be in his image today, we must first know him, not just know of him, but to know him through a personal encounter. When by his invitation, when the Holy Spirit comes and knocks at your door and you open it wide and you look into his eyes of love, suddenly you realize that what you want is not important anymore and we began to search out his will and purpose in our lives and by daily commitment, not just on Sunday morning when everybody else is shouting glory, not just on Sunday night when there's an evangelistic spirit in the air, but daily commitment, we come to know him. Philippians 3 and 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul pens these words from a Roman jail somewhere around 62, 63 AD and for several years after he experienced a personal encounter with Jesus Christ on the the Damascus Road, who appeared to him in a blinding light. He was still saying, 
that I might know him. Hallelujah. He asked in Acts, the ninth chapter in the fifth verse, Who art thou, Lord? And I believe that is the first inquiry that we must make. Who art thou, Lord? I want to know you fully and completely in a personal way. Who are you, Lord? And the next question he asked, he said, What wilt thou have me to do? It is so important that we not only come to know him, but that we ask him, Oh, Lord, what is it that you have for me to do? It can't be the same thing maybe somebody else does. Perhaps you can't sing like Glennis. I can't either. And perhaps you can't uh, uh, be a preacher or a teacher. But I tell you this, God redeems us with a purpose. And he has a will for you. Every one of us, God, has spoken a will for us. He has a job for you to do. And so our next question to the Father to, through Jesus Christ is, what will you have me do? Now I want to tell you, the Lord didn't leave Paul in darkness. He answered him very clearly. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, Paul. I'm the one that you're persecuting when you throw my people in jail, when you drag them off to their deaths. It is not them, but you are persecuting me. And I tell you, we must be careful how we treat the people of God. Because when we are unfair and we are cruel to our brothers and sisters in the Lord, Jesus said, you are persecuting me. So we must be very careful. And then he tells him what to do. He said, I want you to get up from this road, Paul, or Saul, and I want you to go into the city, and there you will be told what you're going to do. Hallelujah. Do you know the Lord sometimes uses somebody else to tell you what you need to do? <laughs> when Kathy called me, she said, Mom, I really feel impressed for you to come and speak. I said, that's great, but the Lord's going to have to tell me too. <laughs> You see, we just can't get up before people on our own. The Lord must anoint his word. Praise the Lord. And so the Lord speaks to somebody else. You see, he always works on both ends. He doesn't just tell one of us something. He tells the other person who has a part to play. And so Ananias, who knew that Paul was coming to destroy the church, the Lord spoke to him. And he said, I want you to go and talk to Paul. You see, Ananias had questions, though. Oh, Lord, this is our enemy. But the Lord says to Ananias, he is a chosen vessel unto me. Hallelujah. You see, it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what we've done. When the Lord speaks to us and we accept the invitation of the Lord, you become a chosen vessel of the Lord. I am a chosen vessel, he said, and he is going to bear my name before Israel, before the Gentiles, and before kings, and then the Lord said, and I will show him what great suffering he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, we all want to glory. We all get to rejoicing in the Lord. We just want all the glory. But I want to tell you there's some suffering that comes along with following the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul began his quest to know the Lord. In the years that followed this personal encounter with Jesus, he did, in fact, witness the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to his fellow brethren, Israel. He also carried the gospel to the Gentiles and began to set up churches throughout the known world at that time. And he also appeared before kings and he shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we talk about protocol and how we're supposed to act. The Lord said, you just be my child and I'll show you. I'll tell you, you speak my word. And no matter who you're speaking it before, I'll bless it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Along the way, he came to really know him. He came to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. 
He was beaten five times, 40 stripes save one. Now we say that quickly, but I want to tell you it didn't happen quickly. 39 times, each time he was beaten, it came down upon his back. That was physical suffering. And he was stoned and left for dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, hallelujah, and they began to pray, he began to move. <laughs> hallelujah. And he said, oh, and he was shipwrecked. I, I don't want to listen. I don't want to miss anything here. He was put in Roman stocks more than once. He came to know the Lord through this suffering, and he came to understand that this was part of it, part of knowing God through his suffering. But even after the beatings and after he was put in stocks in the Roman jail, you know how that was? They lifted you up, you know, by your arms. You hung in the air, and they put stocks around your ankles, and there you were, tight couldn't really move, didn't have any control of your body. And so you had to just stay there in that place. But I want to tell you what, old Paul started praising the Lord somewhere around midnight. <laughs> he began to glorify Jesus Christ and the Father. Something happened to his spirit. I want to tell you, you can punch out my eyes. You can cut off my hands and my feet. But you cannot take the spirit of the living God from my soul. Hallelujah. I can still praise the Lord. And so Paul said, oh, it's time for us to have a praise service. <laughs> and he began to just praise the Lord. You know what God's response was? He shook that Roman jail and all the stocks fell off. Hallelujah. The Lord is powerful and he is great. And when the world comes against us, they cannot hold us because he is greater in you than in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a difference in suffering as a result of our own failings and suffering for the cause of Christ. And sometimes we get those mixed up. But I believe that when we suffer for Jesus Christ, there is a joy that comes with that. In, sp in fact, the scripture said, rejoice when you are chosen to suffer for the gospel's sake. Paul also said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Paul looked beyond the suffering and he declared this body that is marred, that is scarred, that is weary, this body will be changed into a glorious body that will inhabit eternity and will never know suffering again by the power of his resurrection. In other words, he said, I triumph over death, over suffering, over all things that come to me. Romans 8 and 18, for I reckon, or I believe, or I give an accounting, hallelujah, that the sufferings of this, present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed unto us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Once we get to know him in this realm, we become conformed to his image, to his image. Romans 12 and 2, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, transformed, changed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, listen, that you may prove as your, the renewing of your mind takes place 
and you become a changed person through Jesus Christ the Lord. Something happens to your personal life and you may prove you show it to the world what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect, not your will, but whose? Will of God. What is that good will in your life? What is that perfect will of God in your life? Now, I think that comes kind of in steps to us because it takes us a while to get all that old self-will out of the way. <laughs> and so we show to the world Jesus Christ in us as we allow his will, his good, his acceptable, and his perfect will to operate in our lives. Let me tell you, this has got to work all the time. It is no good if it just works part-time. It must work all the time that we commit our will to the will of the Lord. The transformation begins by the renewing of our mind and all things become new. Let me tell you, the me first attitude gets lost in Jesus Christ. We cannot say, I want my way anymore. <laughs> we must say, Lord, wherever you take me, whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. The treasures of this world become secondary. Secondary in our minds and our thinking. Now, we all have to do things. We all have to have some things along the way. But that must not ever become the priority. He must always be first. And once we come to know him in that way, we can truly sing that song we sang last night together. The things of the world, strangely dim, in the light of his glory and grace. Hallelujah. The closer we get to that glory that Paul talked about, everything else recedes, and we begin to only see and want and want, desire the glory of the Lord in our life. Paul says in Philippians 3, 8 and 9, I count all things but loss for the excellency. That word means not mediocre, not just part the way, not just a little bit, but it means excellent. To know him, to understand him, I want to lose all things, everything else that would hinder me to knowing him in excellency, the very best that I can know him of the knowledge of Christ. For whom I have suffered all things, but now listen to this, and do count them as dung that I might win Christ and be found in him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nothing else is important to Paul. I believe we must have this mind, believers, that Jesus is first and we want to become excellent soldiers of the cross for Christ. I might excel in him. Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Roman citizen, student of the renowned teacher Gamaliel, and as touching the law, the scripture said, blameless. He was elevated to recognition by man. His credentials were of the highest order. But he says, I count all things lost. Hallelujah, I want to excel in Christ and more than anything else in the world to be found in him. Are you in him this morning? Hallelujah, when he looks down upon you, are you found in him today? Hallelujah, let's just praise him. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, to be found in him. 
Now, in 2 Corinthians, Paul brags a little bit about his family tree. I'm going to read a portion of that scripture, uh, 4 and 4. Paul, Paul speaks of Christ. He says, who is the image of God? Who is the image of God? And I want you to turn to Colossians, the first chapter. And I want us to read together the 13th through the 15th verse. And again, he talks about Jesus, the image of God, his family tree, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us unto, into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. It is through him that we are redeemed today. We stand justified in his righteousness, not because we're good, not because we're worthy, but because the precious blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to our lives. So Paul tells us that we, that Christ is in the very image of God. Matthew 14, 9 and 10, Jesus says to Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. There was a great mystery. People wanted to know more about the Father. And so Jesus said, If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. I speak not of myself. Now, this is the very Son of God. I speak not of myself, but the Father who dwelleth, abideth, liveth in me. He doeth the works. We must not take or even think of taking away the glory and the power of the Lord by taking any credit. You see, Jesus didn't even do that. He said, I came to do what the Lord, my Father, asked me to do. And whatever works I do, He does it in me. <laughs> you see, if there's any success in this, in this work of the Lord, it is because the Lord does it through your vessel. It is because His power operates through you. And then comes the success. We cannot build ourselves up. We must not. It is the glory of the Lord and the power of the Lord. And so He said, we are what? Of one Spirit. Do you know that the unity of the Spirit is what makes this thing work? We must be in unity. We must lose sight of everything else except the Spirit and the power of the Lord that works in us and in the body of Christ. We must be of one mind, of one spirit, of one purpose. My Father and I are... Hallelujah. Whatever my Father wants, I'm going to do. I believe that we need to know whatever the Lord wants us to do. We need to say, I'm going to do it. I want to do it wherever it takes me. Whomever I come in contact with, I want to have the mind of God to do His will. Hebrews 10 and 9 declares the mission of Christ in the earth. Then said He, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Lord. He taketh away the first sacrifice. This is in Hebrews 10, 9 through 12. He taketh away the first sacrifice that he may establish the second. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Of the world. Everyone is, can be covered with his blood. Praise the Lord. It is perpetual. What does that mean? Once and for all. 
Those of you who are in Weston Hall, the great gold pendulum that swings back and forth. I know you've noticed it. I was kind of mesmerized by it when I first came in. I go out each morning and watch it swing. I go down and see if it's moved any. You know, there's, a, there's this um, circular piece, and, and uh, as the earth rotates on its axis, that moves a little between those two curves that you see. There was a theory by Foucault, our French ladies told me how to pronounce that word this morning. And he discovered, he was a great scientist and journalist, and he discovered that you could hang the pendulum and set it in motion, and it would stay that way without stopping. It is perpetual motion. The Duke of, um, let me get it right, uh, Edinburgh, Prince Philip, in July 31, 1992, set that pendulum in motion. It's been going ever since. And unless somebody stops it deliberately, it'll keep on going as long as the earth turns. As, the, as long as the earth rotates. But I want to tell you something. Hallelujah. That perpetual sacrifice uh, that Jesus made for us once and for all. Hallelujah. It's going to go on and on. On and on to cover the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more is there a need for sacrifice. He did it once and for all. You are redeemed. Hallelujah. Redeemed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And until there is time no more, it shall be forever flowing. It will never shut off. It will continue through the ages of time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, nobody else could do that for you but Jesus. The spotless Lamb of God. Hallelujah. In John 17 and 23, Jesus in his prayer to the Father for his disciples brings the connection of image to full circle. This is important. This is important. I in them. Ha, praise the Lord. And thou in me. That they may be perfect in one praise the lord do you know when we get the picture of that we stop looking at each other and trying to make me like you you like me we lose sight of that doesn't matter doesn't matter what you look like doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter what language you speak Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, for we bear the image of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. We bear his image, and I can come to you as you have come to me throughout the evening, last evening, and as I've greeted you in the hallways, I want to tell you, you are my sister in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I claim you because you are a part of my family tree. Hallelujah. The same blood that bought me, bought you, and has made you perfect in one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
we get too concerned about how we part our hair and how we wear it and what kind of clothes we wear and whether we're in style or not. But I want to tell you, we need to lose sight of all that stuff and we need to look at each other and see Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And I guarantee you that once we do that, there'll be unity in the body. There'll be unity in the body when we make Jesus first and we become in his image. When we can look at each other and see him. Now I want to tell you something. That means more Hallelujah. Rejoice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just rejoice this morning. Hallelujah. I want you to have liberty. Just rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I tell you what, I grew up in the church. My father was a minister. And as Kathy said last night, my grandmother had began the first church in her part of the country, and she was one of the first to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She was ostracized by her neighbors. They stoned the church building once they finally got it built and set fire to it. But I want to tell you what the Spirit of the Holy Ghost continued to operate in her life. Those rocks and that fire did not make a bit of difference. <laughs> because the Lord reigned in her life. And I've been in church for all my life. I used to follow my dad across the pulpit when my mom wasn't there. <laughs> she wouldn't let me do it when she was there. But when he was preaching, I'd go right behind him. When he'd move his arm, I'd move mine. So I've been in church a long time. And I've watched people try to perfect the church. We get in trouble, folks. We get in trouble. Because, see, the only perfect one. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad we can't do it? <laughs> Aren't you glad he's the only one who can? But I want to tell you, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does what the Father and the Son tell him to do. See, they're three in one. They all are of one mind, one spirit. They're all in one. And so when the Holy Spirit moves among us, <laughs> he begins to root out all that stuff that's not like the Lord. He begins to bring us to an understanding of his word. We no longer listen to what sister so-and-so interprets, but we begin to listen with a spiritual ear to what thus saith the holy word of God by the interpretation of the Holy Spirit of the Lord that lives in us. You see, he has taken up residence. <laughs> he abides inside. He prompts us. He teaches us. He tells us all things. And when we get to the place that we say, Lord, I don't quite understand this. I want you to help me. Let me tell you, that Holy Spirit begins to work in us. <laughs> and we begin to see a clearer vision of what God wants us to do and his word. And we become to understand it better. Well, let me tell you, that Holy Spirit is not just working in this building this morning. That Holy Spirit is moving across the face of the world, the face of the earth, and he's getting his bride ready. Hallelujah. He's preparing his bride. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Something's happening all across the world this morning. The Holy Spirit is tearing down the walls that man has built. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, the men 
men built walls. My husband and I were traveling, and as we passed through each little community on Sunday morning, I saw all these various churches with all these names, different names, people going into each one. And I said, you know, man has erect, erected this structure. Man established. I'll let you in, but you can't come in. If you don't do what I say, you can't come in and be a part of us. But I want to tell you the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is tearing down the walls of man has established. He has taken away the position that man has put himself in. And he is saying, if you want to be a part of my bride, you're going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. And you're going to be in one mind, in one spirit, in one body, through the power of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You see, our name sometimes are, is important. You see, Kathy's asked us to wear our name tags, and I, I was disobedient this morning. I forgot mine because our name is important to us, and it's kind of nice to hear our name called out, you know, depending on where we are. <laughs> But I want to tell you, we know no other name but Jesus. No other name. At his name, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is Lord, He is Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect or whole in one. And why? 
that the world, those that don't know me, that the world might know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me them as thou hast loved me. You see this morning, God loved us so much, the Father loved us so much that he's made us heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so he said, I want you to be perfect and in one so that the world can see that the Father loves you and that he sent me into the world. The connection is, is that we have a oneness in spirit to fulfill God's will. Now, I have never played politics in church. I never will. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. I don't believe you ought to go and, and um, you know, kind of promote yourself. I never have. When they began to talk about appointment to the church, wherever church I was attending, I began to ask the Lord, you send us, Lord, who's going to fill our spirit and bless us. Whatever his name or her name might be, you send us the right one, Lord, that'll pull this church together and have us working in unity. Send us the right one, Lord. I don't want to go to the overseer and say, I'd like to have so-and-so because they have the right pedigree. They're like us. <laughs> you see, you need somebody that's not like you. You need to change some. We need to all, all move up a little. Praise the Lord. And so, oneness in spirit that we fulfill God's will. And this moves us beyond physical likenesses and wanting to be alike in ourselves into the spiritual realm so that we can be like Christ. Now that means that we talk like him, that we walk like him, Amen. that we act like him. In the stresses of life that we continue to act like him. And then it causes us to seek out, not just wait for it to fall in our lap, but to seek the will of God for our lives. And then once we know it, to do it. Sometimes he tells us what it is and we say, oh Lord, I don't want to do that. <laughs> in fact, when Kathy said, I want you to speak in English, I said, oh Kathy, I don't want to do that. I want to come and be a retreater. You see the Lord, we must give our will to him. Whether we really want to or not. But once we seek it and we know it, then it is up to us to do the will of the Father through Christ Jesus. How do we connect? We have put everything else sometimes in the center of our faith. We have misplaced Jesus and put something else there and made it more important. But I want to tell you that Christ must be the center. He must be the point that we look toward. Only him to keep the faith. To cling to him. That means with all your strength and all your might when the enemy comes, cling to him. Trust him implicitly for all things. Then when you go through your personal Gethsemane, when it is time for you to say with beads of sweat, hallelujah, we can say, not my will, O oh Lord, but thine be done. Hallelujah. Praise his name. And when you scale the mountaintop of transfiguration and there's glory all around, that we can say, Thou art the Christ with power and with victory and know that He is. Because He is Lord, sovereign God of both the suffering and the glory. John 3 and 2. John writes the proclamation. Beloved, now we are 
the sons of God. <laughs> we take on his characteristics. His love reaches and touches the lonely through us. His long suffering and humility tempers our impatience and pride. His compassion shines through as we minister to the homeless and the lost and the forgotten people of this world. And there's a lot of them. Do you know that you may pass one on the street that doesn't know where to find the answer? And you have the answer to share. It is Jesus Christ in us. Hallelujah. John goes on to say, we don't know what we're going to look like. But we know when we see him, we're going to be like him. The veil is going to be lifted and we'll get to see all that glory. <laughs> You see, we've only been able to see a little bit. Sometimes when the glory of the Lord comes down and kind of rests on us, you look around and you see people's faces just kind of shining. What is that? You see, in, in the Old Testament, it was the Shekinah glory that came down in the temple. On the top of the mountain with Moses, as he came down, his face shone so much they had to put a, a veil over him because the people couldn't stand to look at him because he'd been close to the glory of the Lord. But oh, hallelujah, these eyes are going to become spiritual eyes. We're going to get to see him like he is. It's not going to be in part anymore, but we're going to be at, like him in the fullest extent. You see, that's why we have to get to know him here. So we'll be comfortable with him there. <laughs> we become comfortable with each other as we get to know each other. Well, we, we need to get to know him here. You see, the Lord wants to look down. Jesus wants to look down and see himself. He wants to look at you this morning and see himself. Remember our um, devotion last night. To be the mirror image of Jesus Christ. He wants to look at us and see himself in us <laughs> hallelujah we need more than anything else to desire to be in his image Pascal one of the greatest minds of the mid 17th century he was acclaimed for many learned theories and inventions he was recognized as a great physicist and mathematician he made the first calculator ever made he searched for absolutes in science, but he never found it. In November of 1654, God appeared to him in a vision. And the words to him was, renounce the world, surrender to Jesus Christ. He accepted that invitation. And in his letters, after he came to know the Lord, he said, I have finally found the absolute truth. For he is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And he said, I have found him. He said, there are heroes that do exploits. There are, there are three different types of people in the world. There are those who do exploits and receive acclaim by millions. And they are remembered after their death, and they also are well known during their lifetime. Such people, I guess, as Napoleon and others that we all study and know about. He said, there others are by brilliance of their imagination and intellect attain high honor of a pure, higher kind whose fame is confined to a select few. But then he said, far greater than either of these are those who renounce themselves for compassion and love of mankind. In this order, the Savior of the world came, and those who follow his example, enabled by his grace. 
You see, we can't do it unless His grace is there. Unless His grace enables us to do it, we can't do it in our own selves. Most closely become like Him or to be in His image. So it is the servant's life we live. Jesus said, fine linen is for the king's palace. We are servants one to another. We give his love. We show his grace. We share the salvation of the Lord through his gospel. Vessels, vessels in his image. The decision is yours. God has never held us by puppet strings and moved us against our will. So we must commit our will. Give it to him. Give it to him. Surrender it. Let him have it. And so we must decide whether we will pursue our own will, whether we will do what we want to do, or whether we will actually renounce not only the world, this, yourself, myself, ourself. What did he say? That we give ourselves as a sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable to who? <laughs> yes, and, and Sister Murray has reminded me that's our reasonable service. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we decide whether we'll surrender to Jesus Christ, whether we will really commit ourselves to being in his image. That commitment leads to both suffering and glory. It's an awesome journey. <laughs> but he is with us Amen. and in us Amen. and we are one Amen. in him Amen. hallelujah Amen. praise the Lord I believe that I'm just about on time but I have one thing more I, I didn't know whether I was going to share this or not but the Lord seems to be prompting and so I'm going to do that God has promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. In Christ, God revealed his faithfulness from the beginning of time. So I want to go with you this morning through the word. In Genesis, Jesus is the ram at Abraham's altar. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the high priest. In Numbers, he's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the city of our refuge. In Joshua, he is the scarlet thread out of Rahab's window. In Judges, he is our judge. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything that is is broken. In Esther, he is the Mordecai setting faithful at the gate. In Job, he's our redeemer that ever liveth. In Psalms, he is our shepherd and we shall not want. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, the beautiful bridegroom. In Isaiah, the suffering servant. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, it is Jesus that is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Hosea, he is my love and is forever faithful. In Joel, he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is our savior. In Jonah, he is the great foreign missionary that takes the word to all the world. 
You go and see him in Micah. He is the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is the avenger. In Habakkuk, he is the watchman that is ever praying for revival. And God, give it to us across this world. In Zephaniah, he is the Lord mighty to save. In Haggai, the restorer of our lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. Have you taken a drink this morning? Hallelujah. Everlasting water. Praise the Lord. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Do you need healing this morning? Hallelujah. I believe the wings of the Lord are passing this way today to give to you the healing that is in his wings. In Matthew, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he is the miracle worker. In Luke, he is the son of man. And in John, he is the door by which every man must enter. In Acts, he is the shining light that appears to Saul on the road of Damascus. In Romans, he is our justifier. In 1 Corinthians, our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, our sin bearer. In Galatians, he redeems us from the law. In Ephesians, he is our unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he supplies our every need. In Colossians, his, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In First and Second Thessalonians, he is our soon coming king. Do you believe it this morning? Hallelujah. He is our soon coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he is the mediator between God and man. In Titus, he is the blessed hope. In Philemon, he is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, it is the Lord that heals the sick. In 1st and 2nd Peter, he is the chief shepherd. And in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it is Jesus who has the tenderness of love. Hallelujah. I want to pause there for just a minute. John, the only apostle that did not die a martyr's death and grew to be an old man when they helped him to the pulpit in order for him to preach to the church that last time. Guess what he said? Little children, love one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love one another, love one another. Love is stronger than any other force in the world. Stronger than hate, stronger than violence. Love one another. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints and I wanna be one, hallelujah. And in Revelation, lift up your eyes, church, for your redemption draweth nigh. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Bless his holy and righteous name forever. Hallelujah. Why wouldn't we want to be in his image? Hallelujah. I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. I want to know him this morning. I believe he's in this place. I believe he's passing by us. Hallelujah. I don't want him to pass by without me taking him to myself and saying, Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. Hallelujah. I invite you this morning to stand in the presence of the Lord God Almighty and take him unto yourself as he takes you unto himself. Father, this morning, the Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. And we are your daughters. You recognize the daughter of Israel. You called her, hallelujah. And you recognize us this morning. You are our God, hallelujah. And we want to know you. We rejoice in you. We rejoice in you. We rejoice in you. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, herein is love, not that we necessarily loved you, but that you loved us and sent your son to be the propitiation for our sins. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 He is the pourer out this morning. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. The word says he's the glory and the lifter of our head. <laughs> I think about how he passed that woman that was bent over in Israel that morning. <laughs> it was the Sabbath. <laughs> but he looked at her and he recognized her over the day over the Sabbath, and in her bent over shape, he reached down and touched her and gave her dignity and allowed her to stand. And when those around him questioned him and condemned him, he said, this is a daughter of Israel. It's the only place in the whole Bible where the woman was recognized as a daughter of Israel laying the same claims to the kinship and the family of God. This morning he walks through this place and he recognizes you as the daughter of God. Hallelujah. He is the glory and the lifter of my head. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we want to know you. We want to know you. We thank you for this word that has gone forth this morning. We pray, Lord, that as you have anointed the word, as you have anointed this vessel, that you would continue to work up the ground, work up the dirt, work up the soil, and plant that seed deep, Lord, in that rich soil of our soul and our spirit, and allow it to spring forth into life, and allow it to bring forth the fruit that you so desire. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. And they all said, Amen. Amen. And Amen.